19. Fasting phased out. And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. Mark 9 verse 29. In the battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, prayer and fasting remains one of the most underutilized weapons in a Christian spiritual arsenal. It should come as no surprise that Satan takes such aggressive steps to destroy or neutralize this very important channel to the Almighty. Unfortunately, the modern versions have become his most valuable and effective instrument. The relative importance of any particular biblical subject can easily be determined. Simply study the degree to which it is attacked in the modern versions. The modern version's treatment of fasting is an excellent case in point. Fasting is a sorely neglected Christian discipline relegated by many to a practice associated to only Old Testament saints. For this reason, the vast majority of Christians have never fasted a single time in their lives. The purpose of fasting. Fasting should be an important part of every Christian's life. Christians who truly desire God's intervention should incorporate fasting with their prayer time. Fasting is a practice which enables the soul and spirit to overcome the desires of the flesh. The Apostle Paul points out that he had power with God because he kept his body under subjection. Paul did not allow the desires of the flesh to control his life. As various aspects of fasting are discussed, keep this truth in mind. KJB 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27 But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Paul accomplished much for the Lord because he understood the importance of bringing his body into subjection to his soul and spirit. When the body, or the flesh, controls, God no longer influences the individual's life to the degree he desires. Fasting helps to overcome the flesh and bring about supernatural outcomes. Fasting is a means of bringing the body into subjection to God. Contrary to the modern versions, fasting is not a means of abusing the body as the NIV insanely proposes Christians should do. Neve. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27 No, I beat my body and make it my slave. Fasting includes many components, much more than simply going without food. Abstaining from any physical pleasures during the period of the fast is one of the most important aspects of an effectively scriptural fast. Refraining from eating satisfies one of the most obvious components of the fast. Forgo physical pleasures. Three critical verses located in the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians reveal the importance of fasting as it applies to Christians today. The first of these verses reveals that a person must forego participation in pleasures of the flesh, including physical intimacy with a spouse, during the period of the fast in order to give himself to fasting and prayer. KJB 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5 Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. The critical truth conveyed in the KJB is that fasting does not simply comprise abstinence from food, but from other physical pleasures as well. The NIV completely removes fasting from this verse, thereby destroying the true teaching and the intent of fasting. A person reading the NIV is not taught to forego food and other physical pleasures during a fast. Neve. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5 Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The Apostle Paul's writings, as revealed in the KJB, instruct the Christian while fasting to abstain from physical relations with a spouse. The NIV makes very little sense when it omits fasting from the verse leaving only prayer. Common sense demands certain things not to take place during prayer time. Fasting occurs over an extended period and is more continuous in nature than prayer. Few people have prayed without interruption for 24 hours. However, fasting must be uninterrupted in order to be a true fast. Most Christians assumedly do not relegate their prayer time to coincide with physical relations with one's spouse. However, it makes sense that God would need to instruct the Christian to refrain from physical relations during a fasting period. This directive of abstaining from intimacy should be further applied to other flesh-satisfying activities, including watching television, going bowling, or any of a variety of other actions. A person fasting should abstain from all activities naturally satisfying to the flesh in order to concentrate the flesh-rejecting fast coupled with prayer. The NIV destroys most references to fasting.
However, the New Century version, copyright 1993, deletes every mention of fasting in the passages covering this topic. The NCV is a member of the fourth generation of Bible versions. Gradual deletions by earlier versions like the NIV have brought about the complete removal of fasting in the NCV. Take note how the changes incorporated into the NCV match the NIV in the next passage. NCV 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5 Do not refuse to give your bodies to each other, unless you both agree to stay away from sexual relations for a time so you can give your time to prayer. Then come together again so Satan cannot tempt you because of a lack of self-control. In this case, the NCV matches the NIV. As we will see in other passages, the NCV perverts the truth to a far greater degree than its predecessors do. Ministers approved of God Paul testified to the fact that he fasted. Although God had instituted the fast in the Old Testament, fasting was an applicable practice for Paul and for us during this church age. Paul wrote that he approved himself as the minister of God in much fastings. KJB 2 Corinthians 6 verse 4 But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, five in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. The NIV distorts and destroys this record of the fact that Paul spent much time fasting. Simple hunger can arise from a host of reasons besides fasting for a spiritual purpose. Neve. The NIV distorts and destroys this record of the fact that Paul spent much time fasting. Simple hunger can arise from a host of reasons besides fasting for a spiritual purpose. Neve. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 4 Rather, as servants of God we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance. In troubles, hardships and distresses, five in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. The NIV once again distorts the truth. Unfortunately for the modern version reader, the NCV does so to a greater degree. Following the lead of the NIV, the NCV states, sometimes we get no sleep or food. This passage from the NCV sounds less like a record of Christian fasting and more like a testament of God's failure to provide for Paul's physical and material needs. NCV 2 Corinthians 6 verse 4 But in every way we show we are servants of God, in accepting many hard things, in troubles, in difficulties, and in great problems. We are beaten and thrown into prison. We meet those who become upset with us and start riots. We work hard, and sometimes we get no sleep or food. Hunger versus fasting. God again catches the devil and his cohorts red-handed hatching their diabolical plot. The next verse serves as another record of Paul's frequent fastings. This verse from the KJB mentions not only fasting, but also hunger, distinguishing between the two elements. Paul was likely involuntarily in hunger, but voluntarily fasted to promote submission of the body to spiritual matters. KJB 2 Corinthians 11 verse 27 In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Fasting should be a very important aspect of the Christian walk with God. If you have never fasted, note the following simple suggestions. 1. Don't eat anything, except maybe a breath mint. 2. Drink only water or juice for a longer fast. 3. Pray about how long God would have you fast and stick to that time. Continue for a minimum of 24 hours, praying continually. 4. Abstain from things satisfying to the flesh. 5. Begin eating slowly and lightly following the fast. Notice that the KJB mentions Paul was in hunger and fastings often. This verse denotes two distinctly separate actions or experiences. God knew that Satan would attempt to destroy the doctrine of fasting, therefore, he included both fastings and hunger in the same verse. The NIV translators foolishly changed fastings often to often gone without food. Neve, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 27 I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep, I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food, I have been cold and naked. The NIV's redundancy exposes its error. Did Paul really say that he has known hunger and then, later in the very same verse, state that he has often gone without food? The fact of the matter is simple. The devil does not want you to know that the Apostle Paul fasted for spiritual reasons. 
Again, we see that the more up-to-date of the modern versions deletes any reference to fasting as well. NCV 2 Corinthians 11 verse 27 I have done hard and tiring work, and many times I did not sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty, and many times I have been without food. I have been cold and without clothes. In addition to the fasting problem, the NCV makes Paul repeatedly say I five times in one verse associating him with the point made about Lucifer using the word I five times as he sought to overthrow and replace God, Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 14. A person can't preach these new versions. They read more like the complaining of a whimpering baby. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians in such a manner, eliciting more pity than praise? Fasting is not optional. The Lord did not begin his discourse on fasting by qualifying his remarks with the word if. Instead, he began, when ye fast. KJB Matthew 6 verse 16 Moreover when ye fast, be not, as the hypocrites, of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. 17 But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face. 18 That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. The Lord Jesus Christ never directly commanded Christians to fast. Instead, he took it for granted that they would fast, and went on to give instructions concerning regulation of the practice. Many read Matthew chapter 6 and conclude that no one should ever know that you are fasting. Many Christians therefore wonder if it is permissible to reveal their fast to others. The Lord Jesus Christ simply pointed out the hypocrisy of people fasting with the wrong motive. One is not to appear to be fasting by using contorted facial expressions. Consciously attempting to appear spiritual before others does not reflect true holiness before God. Any person who fasts to be seen of men fails to possess true holiness. All such hypocrisy is abominable to God. Fasting to overcome addiction. Fasting is the best way to overcome an addiction and to allow a person to grow closer to God. Few things in life give the soul and spirit preeminence over the flesh as fasting does. Accordingly, God blesses the person who scripturally fasts. The NIV removes every reference to the Apostle Paul's fasting, Romans 11 verse 13, 2 Timothy 1 verse 11. Satan waited until a later Bible version to attack the passage in Matthew concerning fasting. All references to fasting retained in the NIV are removed from the NCV. Remember that fasting does not constitute simple abstinence from food, but includes among other things, abstaining from sexual intimacy with one's spouse. NCV Matthew 6 verse 16 When you give up eating, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They make their faces look sad to show people they are giving up eating. I tell you the truth, those hypocrites already have their full reward. 17 So when you give up eating, comb your hair and wash your face. 18 Then people will not know that you are giving up eating, but your father, whom you cannot see, will see you. Your father sees what is done in secret, and he will reward you. When you give up eating, fasting means so much more than simply foregoing a meal or two. It involves rejecting the things of the flesh. Eating is simply one of the more obvious and most prevalent flesh-satisfying activities in which we all engage daily. The NCV mentions the word fasting only in its footnotes and defines the practice as giving up eating. As we have already seen, this definition is incomplete and inadequate. No wonder the Bible forecasts Christianity's spiritual shallowness in these last days. A reader of the modern Bible versions cannot find out the truth unless he picks up God's true book. Fasting should never become a religious ritual. Do not be like the religious Pharisee in Luke chapter 18. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I posses. Luke 18 verse 12. This Pharisee made a ritual of fasting, twice every week. Making a ritual of even spiritual things removes the heart far from the matter. Instead, one should make it a rule to fast with the same frequency as the New Testament commands us to partake of the Lord's Supper, for as often as ye eat this bread. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. We are not told how often to partake of the Lord's Supper. This is a matter to be settled between the church, its pastor, and God, as the Spirit of God leads each individual church. 
An individual should fast because his relationship and heart are right with God, and the Spirit of God has led him to fast about a specific matter or for a specific purpose. The act of fasting does not make a person spiritual. Fasting is a personal matter, as is the prayer within one's prayer closet. When God places a fast on your heart, obey Him and He will bless you. He will answer your prayer, and this disciplined practice will strengthen your soul and spirit, helping you to overcome the flesh. Biblical Examples The Bible emphasizes three contexts for fasting, fasting for others, fasting in order to seek God's help and fasting for God's guidance and direction. It is hard to adequately express the importance of fasting, but its complete erasure in the most modern versions offers a glimpse. The NIV leaves the following verses somewhat intact, however, the NCV completely destroys the doctrine of fasting. 1. Fasting for others When Haman plotted to kill all of the Jews, Queen Esther was uniquely in position to intervene. Saving the Jews meant Esther had to approach the king uninvited, a move that could bring death. In preparation for the daunting moment, Queen Esther asks others to fast for her or does she? KJB Esther 4 verse 15 Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, 16 Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. NCV Esther 4 verse 15 Then Esther sent this answer to Mordecai, 16 Go and get all the Jewish people in Susa together. For my sake, give up eating, do not eat or drink for three days, night and day. I and my servant girls will also give up eating. Then I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I die, I die. After reading the story of Esther in the NCV, can one really conclude that she fasted or just wanted to ensure no food distractions? Having dedicated thousands of hours to Bible study, the author sees no possible way to study the Bible using the NCV. Because Bible words are not retained in this and similar versions, the opportunity for cross-referencing is completely lost. What chance will future Christians, without the KJB, have to know the truth when all references to many of these important truths have been completely destroyed? One can certainly imagine that some deluded soul will read of Esther in a future Bible version and arrive at incongruous conclusions. For example, such a person might imagine that Esther had an eating disorder and losing weight would please the king. Because she gives up eating and consequently loses weight, she is able to courageously approach the king without suffering any negative consequences. This conclusion is just as reasonable as the action of replacing the word fasting with the limited definition of abstaining from food. 2. Fasting to seek the Lord and ask help of him, the children of Moab and Ammon came up to battle against Jehoshaphat. KJB 2 Chronicles 20 verse 3 And Jehoshaphat feared, and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. For in Judah gathered themselves together, to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Fasting helps to discern the will of God. Jehoshaphat proclaimed a fast for the people to seek the Lord. We too should fast when deeply troubled or burdened with some matter such as family problems, disobedient children, and addiction, etc. NCV 2 Chronicles 20 verse 3 Jehoshaphat was afraid, so he decided to ask the Lord what to do. He announced that no one in Judah should eat during this special time of prayer to God. The NCV simply says that no one should eat. The devil knows the average reader will not draw the same conclusion using these different versions. He wants Christians to be ignorant of the truth. Satan most fears dedicated, soul-winning prayer warriors armed with an understanding of the importance of prayer and fasting. 3. Fasting to discern direction for the home. A person should fast in order to determine direction for himself, his children, and his possessions. KJB Ezra 8 verse 21 Then I proclaimed a fast there, at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of him a right way for us, and for our little ones, and for all our substance. Fast to discern directions for yourself, your children and grandchildren, your possessions, the things with which God has blessed you. Prayer and fasting in the KJB assist the Christian in learning God's will for every aspect of his life. NCV Ezra 8 verse 21 There by the Ahava Canal, I announced we would all give up eating and humble ourselves before our God. 
we would ask God for a safe trip for ourselves, our children, and all our possessions. Give up food and ask God for a safe trip? Satan must take a sort of perverted comfort in rewriting the Bible, the history of the Bible, and the history of man. If we do not learn from the past, we are condemned to repeat the mistakes of our predecessors. We can easily become disillusioned by not knowing our rich heritage. The history of the United States includes many instances in which prayer and fasting have altered the course of events. As expected, however, these are not well-publicized instances since most people are generally very ignorant of the past as it relates to spiritual matters. Dr. Paul Tan relates the following story. In the early spring of 1877, Minnesota farmers surveyed their lands, dreading the first hordes of locusts that had caused such widespread destruction the summer before. Another such plague threatened to destroy Minnesota's rich wheat land spelling ruin for thousands of families. Suddenly, Governor John S. Pillsbury proclaimed April 26 the day of fasting and prayer, urging that every man, woman, and child ask divine help. A strange hush fell over the land as Minnesotans solemnly assembled to pray. The next morning the sun rose in cloudless skies. Temperatures soared to midsummer heat. The people looked up at the skies in wonder, and to their horror, the warm earth began to stir the dreaded insects. This was a strange answer. Three days passed. The unseasonable heat hatched out a vast army of locusts that threatened to engulf the entire northwest. Then, on the fourth day the sun went down in a cold sky and that night frost gripped the earth. Most of the locusts were destroyed as surely as if fire had swept them away. When summer came the wheat waved tall and green. April 26th went down in history as the day on which a people's prayer had been answered. Satan has spearheaded the rewriting of our rich Christian history. It is difficult to fathom what the future holds as upcoming generations are raised progressively further from the influence of God's word. Using Bibles like the NCV, Satan ensures that future generations do not even understand the governor's proclamation concerning fasting. According to the modern versions, the governor should have instructed the people of Minnesota to observe a day of not eating in prayer. What purpose is served by not eating unless a person understands the biblical principles of fasting destroyed in the modern versions? As we have seen, fasting means much more than simply foregoing food. Today, governors and mayors across this country are sued for simply asking God's blessing on a high school graduating class or safety for the players at the beginning of a high school football game. This country has forgotten that it was founded based on freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. Some say our Christian heritage is a figment of our imagination. Read the Constitution or the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Our pledge says, One nation under God. Our coins and paper money say in God we trust. Consider America's heritage 20 to 50 years from now. Men like Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura will be remembered. In a November 1999 interview, during his comments concerning the legalization of prostitution, he made a statement that organized religion is a sham and a crutch for weak-minded people who need strength in numbers. He blames the religious right for the fact that prostitution is not legal in this country. Amen. Can there be any doubt as to why God's hand of protection on this country seems to be lifting from us? Our country desperately needs Christians to fast and pray down God's blessings and protection. Although our national need is great, we must not neglect our great personal need, too. Personal Effects of Fasting Fasting has the greatest impact on the soul. Fasting, like prayer, does not force God to do anything, but instead helps to resist supernatural strongholds and powers. The only way to know that fasting affects the soul is to search. The King James Bible No other version the author has researched allows one to realize this truth. Most Bible students understand that they consist of three parts, spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. However, few people realize that their soul also consists of three parts, the mind, will, and emotions. Fasting affects the soul, mind, will, and emotions in three ways. Fasting humbles the soul, chastens the soul, and afflicts the soul. Nothing else in the Bible affects a person's soul in this manner. Therefore, fasting is a very important aspect of the Christian's walk with God. The three parts of the soul are revealed in the scripture as follows. Mind, Romans 7 verse 25, with the mind I myself serve the law of God. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 11, be of one mind. 
Will John 1 verse 13, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Ephesians 6 verse 6, doing the will of God from the heart. Emotions, 1 Samuel 18 verse 1, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Three passages in the King James Bible clearly communicate and emphasize the effect of fasting upon the soul. Although these examples are key points to understand concerning fasting, the NIV and the NCV completely destroy the teachings of Scripture. The consequences are important to recognize. The Christian using a modern Bible cannot determine why fasting should be an important part of his life. We live in a generation that is always asking why. The new versions fail to provide the believer with answers. I, fasting humbles the soul. KJB, Psalm 35 verse 13, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. The KJB says that David humbled his soul with fasting. To humble one's soul means to abase, subdue, mortify, and crush it. The NIV includes fasting but suppresses the point. Satan does not want the Christian to grasp the benefits of fasting for the Christian walk, therefore, the NIV deletes any reference to fasting's effect upon the soul. Neve, Psalm 35 verse 13 Yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting, when my prayers returned to me unanswered. The NIV says that David's prayer returned to him unanswered also deleting any reference to the effect of fasting upon the soul. The NCV further perverts the truth concerning humbling the soul also eliminating any reference to fasting. Such a Bible is worthless for truth seekers. How can one expect to see the truth if the possibility of cross-referencing is eliminated? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual things is a most basic Bible study tool. NCV Psalm 35 verse 13 Yet when they were sick, I put on clothes of sadness and showed my sorrow by going without food but my prayers were not answered. Again, the NCV changes fasting to going without food. Fasting entails much more than simply going without food. It is a Bible word denoting a spiritual act. A person going without food may simply not be hungry. God's word, the King James Bible, says that fasting humbles the soul. Try to imagine the importance of this truth and who it is who might want you to be ignorant of it. Every Christian wages an ongoing, daily battle with his flesh. Fasting is a powerful way to reject the flesh and to directly benefit the soul. Consider this, when a person awakes in the morning, what is the first aspect of himself that generally garners attention? His flesh, of course. Brushing his teeth, taking a shower, drinking coffee, eating food. All of these activities serve the flesh. Would it not be refreshing to place top priority on something other than the flesh? Try fasting if you are ready for the battle of your life. A person's flesh will remain in first place until a person can begin awaking in the morning with the priority of communing with God or reading the Bible. Prayer and fasting are the best ways to suppress the flesh and positively affect the soul. 2. Fasting chastens the soul. KJB Psalm 69 verse 10 When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. King David again reveals another effect of fasting upon the soul. Fasting chastens the soul. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines chastening as correcting by punishment and the infliction of pain for the purpose of reclaiming. All of us need to reclaim our mind, will, and emotions for the Savior. How? Fasting and prayer. Once again, the NIV destroys the truth and the wisdom given by Almighty God. There is no way to find out what he truly wants us to know by reading the NIV or any of the other modern perversions. Neve, Psalm 69 verse 10 When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. Unlike the KJB, the NIV does not reveal that fasting chastens the soul. Those naturally inquisitive want to know why they should do something and what makes it a beneficial practice. If preachers do not have the answers to these questions concerning fasting, those they influence will not consider fasting to be a very important part of life. People seek wisdom and understanding, but find neither in the modern translations. The KJB, by giving knowledge, is used by God to encourage individuals to fast because of its impact upon the soul. Once again, the NCV perverts the truth even further than its modern predecessors. Both chastening and fasting are deleted from the passage. 
NCV. Psalm 69 verse 10 When I cry and go without food, they make fun of me. The New Century Version sounds so repulsive. It makes King David sound like a wimp. Once again, fasting is eliminated and the second soul impacting result of fasting not conveyed. A Southern Baptist pastor recently stated to the author that the New Century Version is a good study Bible. How deceived! Sadly, his congregation seeking for truth is no better off. Fasting must be an important part of a Christian's life or Satan would not expend so much effort and energy to hide its importance. Now, fasting's third impact upon the soul. 3. Fasting afflicts the soul. KJB. Isaiah 58 verse 5, Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Fasting afflicts the soul. To afflict means to trouble, to harass, and to distress. Fasting afflicts the will, emotions, and mind. Fasting helps to align these three with the will of God. As we have seen, fasting humbles the soul, chastens the soul, and afflicts the soul. These truths are evident in the King James Bible. The NIV, consistent with its treatment of truth, omits any reference to the effects of fasting upon the soul. Neve. Isaiah 58 verse 5, Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast a day acceptable to the Lord? The NIV ensures that the Christian remains ignorant of God-ordained truth. One cannot find a single reference in the NIV to the trifold effect of fasting upon a man's soul. Think about that. The fact that all the new versions eliminate these truths should serve as an indicator of how important God considers these truths. The soul-altering effects of fasting are not attributable to any other spiritual act of worship. The NCV does not include even half of the information contained in the pitiful NIV. Thus, the NCV guarantees complete ignorance of the necessity of fasting in a Christian's life and walk. NCV Isaiah 58 verse 5 This kind of special day is not what I want. This is not the way I want people to be sorry for what they have done. I don't want people just to bow their heads like a plant and wear rough cloth and lie in ashes to show their sadness. This is what you do on your special days when you do not eat. But do you think this is what the Lord wants? Special days when you do not eat? The NCV follows the lead of the NIV and previous perversions. In typical fashion, however, this perversion goes a step further than its predecessors purging all semblance of truth. To whom do you attribute this gross perversion of truth? It is hard to miss the satanic influence behind these changes. Principles of Fasting In Isaiah chapter 58, the Lord rebukes those who fasted for the wrong reasons. When God uses His word to correct the Israelites, Bible students should be careful to heed the correction as well. Thus, much can be learned from studying this passage from the book of Isaiah. In this particular chapter, we read that Israel was fasting and yet finding pleasure in their daily routine. KJB Isaiah 58 verse 3 Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou sayest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. For behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness, ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. 5. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, and an acceptable day to the Lord? 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? These principles of fasting apply to those outside of Israel also. In verse 3, the Lord rebukes the Israelites for finding pleasure in the day of their fast. When a person fasts, he cannot simply continue with normal activities. These daily pleasures are to be avoided during this special time. As we have seen, 1 Corinthians instructs the fasting Christian to abstain from physical intimacy with his spouse during the time of the fast. However, application of this principle runs much deeper when considering the truth conveyed through Isaiah. 
During a period of fasting and prayer, one's daily routine involving the feeding of one's flesh must be disrupted. How can a person's soul be affected if the individual remains preoccupied with feeding his flesh? The NCV would have the Bible student believe that going without eating is the primary requirement of a fast. Really, one cannot even be certain from reading the NCV that going without eating constitutes a period of fasting. These NCV changes are lies. A Christian fasts when he desires to get in touch with God. The actions and daily activities of the fasting Christian should be recognizably different from the individual's non-fasting routine. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 4 says that a person fasts in order to make his voice heard on high. This is an important part of fasting that people all too often neglect. True children of God want to be heard by God. Try fasting in prayer to produce a noticeable difference in your prayer life and spiritual well-being. 2 Samuel chapter 12 which follows is an excellent example of the fruits of the biblical fast. The potential to change God's mind. The Bible contains many examples of individuals who understood the importance of fasting. King David was just such a person. Nathan tells David in verse 14 of 2 Samuel chapter 12 that his child will die. David fasts and prays attempting to change the outcome of this grave situation. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted, and went in, and lay all night upon the earth. 2 Samuel 12 verse 16 Because of David's sin with Bathsheba and in spite of this well-intentioned fast, the child perished. Your sin too affects others, as well. David's fasting did not bring about the desired results in this particular instance. However, great truths about fasting are discerned from what David tells his servant later in the same chapter. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me, that the child may live? 23 But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. 2 Samuel 12 verse 22 God pronounced the judgment, and David fasted and prayed attempting to alter the outcome. David's fasting and prayer did not change the pronounced outcome concerning his child. However, as we shall see in the book of Jonah, fasting does hold the potential to change the mind of God concerning the affairs of men. One should recognize the purpose of David's fast as clearly stated in his discussion with his servants. David was trying to change God's pronounced judgment. He wanted his voice heard on high. Once again, the NCV destroys this truth from God's word. NCV 2 Samuel 12 verse 16 David prayed to God for the baby. David refused to eat or drink. He went into his house and stayed there, lying on the ground all night. According to the NCV, King David refused to eat or drink and lay on the ground all night. The NCV makes no mention of any spiritual purpose for David's actions. A reader of the NCV cannot discern why he refused to eat. Did David refuse to eat because he lost his appetite? Was he throwing a temper tantrum while lying on the ground all night? This passage from the NCV sounds more like the story of a spoiled child than a contrite man desperately reaching out to God. Here is further NCV perversion. NCV 2 Samuel 12 verse 22 David said, While the baby was still alive, I refused to eat, and I cried. I thought, who knows? Maybe the Lord will feel sorry for me and let the baby live. But now that the baby is dead, why should I go without food? The nonsense of the NCV bears no relation to the truth of God's true word. The NCV says that David refused to eat and spent the night on the floor. These statements evoke connotations more juvenile than spiritual. The NCV says David refused to eat and cried, hoping that the Lord would feel sorry for him. In contrast, when the KJB uses the Bible word fasting, one immediately understands that there was an attempt on David's part to accomplish some spiritual purpose through spiritual means. Nine Vites change God's mind. Does fasting with prayer change things? It certainly does. David fasted and prayed with the intent to bring God's grace and mercy upon him and his child. David believed that his actions, fasting and prayer, could positively impact the outcome. David did not change God's mind. However, in the book of Jonah, the people of Nineveh did change God's mind escaping his judgment through fasting and prayer. The people of Nineveh got their hearts right and changed their evil ways. Fasting and prayer can change you, too. 
KJB Jonah 3 verse 4 And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried, and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 5 So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them even to the least of them. God heard the prayers of these people, saw their changed hearts, and spared their city from destruction. God had pronounced his judgment, but prayer and fasting reversed the impending doom. KJB Jonah 3 verse 10 And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil, that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Once again, the modern perversions limit fasting to not eating. The NCV gives no indication that the nine vites did anything at all spiritual to spare their city from impending judgment. NCV Jonah 3 verse 5 The people of Nineveh believed God. They announced that they would stop eating for a while, and they put on rough cloth to show their sadness. All of the people in the city did this, from the most important to the least important. The nine vites stopped eating and put on rough cloth to show their sadness. According to the KJB, God honored the fast and its effects on the people. He will do the same for you, your family, your state, and your country. As the King James Bible has shown, fasting can change outcomes. Indeed, some areas of your life can be changed only through fasting and prayer. The passage from Isaiah chapter 58 illustrates the true purpose and outcome of fasting. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Isaiah 58 verse 6 The Bible reveals four results of fasting with no other practice yielding these same results. A person should fast in order to 1. Loosen the bands of wickedness 2. Undo the heavy burdens 3. Let the oppressed go free 4. Break every yoke Smokers, drug addicts, alcoholics, those caught in the sin of pornography, etc. have little hope of ridding themselves of their respective vices and heavy burdens without salvation. What hope is there for the Christian who has strayed away and become enslaved to these or other addictive behaviors? Fasting and prayer can be the difference between failure and success. However, the application of fasting should not be limited to remedying someone else's sinful condition. A marriage that is on the rocks, contrary children and individuals in any type of wickedness can all benefit from heartfelt submission to the Lord through fasting and prayer. Fasting, overcoming strongholds. When Satan has been allowed to gain a stronghold in a person's life, prayer and fasting may be the individual's only hope for deliverance. For example, consider the man in the Gospels who begged Jesus to heal his son, possessed with a devil. This passage contains one of the most important truths conveyed in the Bible concerning fasting. Mark tells the story of a man who came to the Lord concerning his son. The child had a dumb and deaf spirit dash one that attempted to destroy him by casting him into the fire and water. The disciples had been unable to heal this young man. However, the Lord rebuked the spirit curing the boy. This passage best reveals the truth set forth in Isaiah 58 verse 6. The disciples were unable to cast out this devil because fasting and prayer were necessary to free the oppressed and break this yoke of bondage. The disciples asked the Lord why they had lacked the power to help the man and his son. KJB Mark 9 verse 28 And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? 29 And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. The disciples tried to help this boy and his father, but could do nothing because they had not fasted and prayed over the matter. Prayer and fasting release the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free by breaking every yoke of bondage. We know that Jesus fasted and prayed. This boy was not going to be freed until the Lord Jesus Christ loosed him. Is the same truth conveyed by the corrupt NIV? Neve. Mark 9 verse 28 After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? 29 He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. The NIV only mentions prayer. What if the King James Bible is right? The motive underlying these changes in the modern versions should be evident. One of the most powerful tools for effecting change in the life of the believer is not even available to one who reads something other than God's true word, the KJB.
If a person reads the NIV, is he going to find out that fasting and prayer are the only ways to overcome some of the most damaging habits? No, perhaps this is one of the reasons that many churches are so ineffective today. Maybe this is why churches have so many families falling apart with little hope in sight. As we have seen, fasting is omitted when the story of the young man possessed by a devil is told in the Gospel of Mark. However, the Gospels generally retell the same stories, so, perhaps this truth can still be found in one of the other Gospel books. This story is repeated in Matthew chapter 17. KJB Matthew 17 verse 19 Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, and said, Why could not we cast him out? 21 Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. The King James Bible emphasizes the truth concerning prayer and fasting, overcoming the strongholds of Satan. The NIV does not simply change this verse in Matthew chapter 17. It omits the verse entirely. Why? Could fasting be that important? Neve. Matthew 17 verse 19 Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? 21 omitted. As we have seen, both the King James Bible and the rich history of the United States attest to the power of prayer and fasting. However, most Christians today have no real understanding of the importance God has placed on fasting and prayer. Any Christian duped into believing that the modern versions will show them the truth should look for verse 21 in their particular version. Satan hates the fervent Christian on his knees and shudders at the thought of a prayer warrior armed with the truth of fasting and prayer. The NCV also omits verse 21 of Matthew chapter 17, replacing it with a footnote. Why not just believe the Bible? It takes prayer and fasting to rid a person's life of certain infiltrations of the devil and fleshly strongholds. If Satan has achieved victory in a particular area of your life whether it is drugs, alcohol, tobacco, television, lust, lying, unforgiveness, pornography, etc., why not implore God to intervene? Barclay Newman, senior translator on the contemporary English version said, We have aimed at the ear more than the eye. You can read aloud without stumbling and hear without misunderstanding. Newman, who holds a doctorate from a Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, claims that the CEV tries to remain loyal to the meaning of the King James Version of the Bible without being bound to its exact wording. By comparing only a few of the scriptures, one can see how drastically the modern versions have affected major doctrines. Man cannot alter God's word and remain guiltless. God will hold him accountable. Americans are ignorant of their rich Christian heritage, just as they are ignorant of the impact of God's word upon our forefathers. Too many have failed to realize Satan's masterful work of deception. Wake up before it is too late. We need to pray and fast for ourselves, our families, our churches, and our nation. Humility is the key. America has somewhat of a unique responsibility. Our blessings came through our reverence to the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the church's return to him can restore our nation's true greatness. Only the Christian's humble act of submission through prayer and fasting can affect the change this nation greatly desires and needs. Are you doing your part? 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 2. 20. Blame it on the press. The term for major revisions is a misnomer, and as such, is grossly misleading. There were no true revisions in the sense of updating the language or correcting translation errors. Point one Floyd Nolan Jones. Since the devil coached the first woman how to question, add to and subtract from the words of God, men and women have been handling the word of God deceitfully, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. From Cain to Balaam, from Jehudi to the scribes and Pharisees, from the Dark Age theologians to present-day scholars, man's corrupting hand has targeted the living words of the Almighty God. The attacks on the word of God are threefold, addition, subtraction, and substitution. From Adam's day to the computer age, the strategies have remained the same. Indeed, there is nothing new under the sun. One attack which is receiving quite a bit of attention these days is a direct attack on the Word of God as preserved in the English language, the King James Bible of 1611. The attack referred to as the Myth 2 which claims that since the King James Bible of 1611 has already been revised four times, there should be and can be no valid objection to other modern revisions.
This myth was used by the English revisers of 1881 and has been revived in recent years by fundamentalist scholars hoping to sell their newly produced version or to justify their support for their favorite translation now plugged as the next best thing. Many examples can be provided to demonstrate this problem. For instance, read the statement from the Committee on the Bible's Text and Translation from Greenville, South Carolina, found in From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man. In an effort to convey the inspired word in the language of the readers, more than one translation may be produced in one given language. In an effort to improve accuracy, these translations may go through numerous revisions. Even the revered King James Version has gone through at least four major and numerous minor revisions. These revisions are often necessary because living languages are constantly changing in their vocabularies and structures. Emphasis Mine Later in the same book we read, there have been numerous revisions since 1611. During the next 33 years alone there were at least 182 editions, each differing in some way from the others, for this statement on the surface is quite inflammatory, equating the printing of editions with the word revisions. It is complete spiritual infidelity for the contributor of the referenced book to imply that somehow these 182 printed editions of the KJB from 1611 to 1644 compare to the textual changes incorporated into the text by modern version producers. However, if the early KJB editions did in fact differ from their predecessors even in minute ways, this simply confirms the inaccuracy of the early printing methods which is the premise of this chapter. The intention of this chapter is to answer this argument. The purpose of the material herein is not to convince those who wish to deny preservation, but to strengthen the faith of those who already believe in a preserved English Bible. The present chapter provides believers in preservation with the tools necessary to convince the gainsayers, Titus 1 verse 9. One major question repeatedly arises concerning efforts to counter attacks upon the words of God. To what extent should an individual concern himself with satisfactorily answering the critics? If Bible believers devote themselves to answering every shallow objection raised to the infallibility of the English Bible, little else in life would be accomplished. Sanity must intervene and prevail and scripture must be our guide. The answer to this dilemma lies in the pages of God's word. Proverbs 26 verse 4 answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Proverbs 26 verse 5 answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Obviously, there are times when a foolish query should be ignored, but other situations in which such a question should be legitimately addressed. Consider the following rule of thumb, if answering the question causes you to appear as foolish as the attacker, the best answer is no answer at all. For instance, if a Christian is told that the Bible cannot be infallible because so and so believes that it is, and he is divorced, then it is safe to assume that silence is the best answer. On the other hand, serious questions and problems often arise which must be responsibly and judiciously addressed. To ignore issues of this latter sort would be to leave the Bible attacker-wise in his own conceit. In the opinion of the author, the question at hand concerning revisions to the King James Bible of 1611 belongs to the second, legitimate class of inquirers. Had the King James Bible undergone four major revisions of its text, then to oppose further revision on the basis of an established English text would be unreasonable. Consequently, this attack should and must be addressed. Can this argument be answered? Certainly, I. The Printing Conditions of 1611 if God preserved his word in the English language through the authorized version of 1611, and he did, then where is the authority for the infallible wording? Is it in the notes of the translators? Or is it to be found in the proof copy sent to the printers? If either of these is the preserved word of God, then our authority is lost because these papers are long gone. But, you may say, the authority lies in the first printed page to come off the printing press. Alas, that copy has also certainly perished. In fact, since the printing of the English Bible followed the pattern of most printing jobs, the first pages printed were probably discarded after careful scrutiny because of poor quality. That leaves us with existing copies from the first printing. These are the copies often revered as the standard, against which all other King James Bibles are to be compared. But are they? Did those early printers of the first edition not make printing errors? Does the preservation of God's infallible word rely precariously on perfect printing? One principle must be established at the outset of this discussion. 
The authority for the preserved English text is not found in any human work. The authority for our preserved and infallible English text lies in God and Him alone. Printers will fail at times and humans will continue to make plenty of errors, but God in His power and mercy will preserve His text despite the weaknesses of fallible man. Now, let us examine the pressures a printer faced in the year 1611. Although the printing press was invented in Germany in 1450 by Johann Gutenberg, 161 years before the 1611 printing, printing equipment changed only minimally during the intervening span of time. In the year 1611, printing remained an extremely slow, tedious, and laborious task. All type was set by hand, one piece at a time, through the duration of the entire Bible, and errors were an unfortunate but expected element of any printed book. Because of this difficulty, and also because the 1611 printers had no earlier editions from which to profit, the very first edition of the King James Bible contained a number of printing errors. As demonstrated later, however, these errors were not the sort of textual alterations freely made by the modern version publishers. Instead, they were simple, obvious printing errors of the sort that can still occasionally be found in recent editions in spite of the numerous advantages of modern printing technology. Such printing errors did not and do not render a Bible useless, however, they should be corrected in future editions slash printings. The two original printings in 1611 of the authorized version demonstrate the difficulty of printing without making mistakes. Both editions were printed in Oxford. Both were printed in the same year, 1611. The same printers did both jobs. Most likely, both editions were printed on the same printing press equipment. Yet, in a strict comparison of the two editions, approximately 100 textual differences can be found. In the same vein, the King James critics can find only about 400 alleged textual alterations in the King James Bible after 375 years of printing and four so-called revisions. Something is rotten in Scholarsville. The time has come to examine these alleged revisions. Here is another example of this devious philosophy, as recorded in From the Mind of God to the Mind of. Man, what is the significance of two separate 1611 KJV editions? How can I say I have an original 1611 KJV if there were two different editions with numerous discrepancies in the very first year of publication? A revision was done, probably 1613. Almost every edition from the very beginning introduced corrections and unauthorized changes in editions, often adding new errors in the process though the changes in this edition were minor, they still numbered over 300. Emphasis mine. This statement says that these changes and editions were unauthorized. Could simple printing corrections be considered unauthorized? Where is the proof and documentation for these allegations? 2. The four so-called revisions of the 1611 KJB. Much of the information contained in this section is excerpted from a book by FHA. Scrivener entitled The Authorized Edition of the English Bible, 1611, its subsequent reprints and modern representatives. This book is as scholarly as its title conveys. An interesting point to note is that Scrivener, who published his book in 1884, was a member of the Revision Committee of 1881. However, he disagreed with the actions of the committee on numerous occasions. In a section of Scrivener's book devoted to addressing the KJV revisions, one initial detail is striking. The first two so-called major revisions of the King James Bible occurred within 27 years of its original printing. According to the philosophy of modern version production, the English language must have been changing very rapidly in those days to warrant two revisions in 27 years. The 1629 edition of the Bible printed in Cambridge is said to have been the first revision. A revision it was not. A careful correction of earlier printing errors it was. Not only was this edition completed just 18 years after the 1611 translation was completed, but two of the men who participated in the 1629 printing, Dr. Samuel Ward and John Bois, had contributed to the original translation of the King James Bible. Was anyone more eminently qualified to correct early printing errors than two of the men who had worked on the original edition? Only nine years later, and again in Cambridge, another edition of the King James Bible was published. This edition is purported to have been the second major KJB revision. Both Samuel Ward and John Bois were still alive, but it is not known if they participated in the printing of this edition.
Scrivener, who worked on the English Revised Version of 1881, agreed that the Cambridge printers had simply reinstated words and clauses overlooked by the 1611 printers and amended obvious errors. According to a study detailed later in the chapter, 72% of the approximately 400 textual corrections in the KJB were completed by the time the 1638 Cambridge edition was printed, only 27 years after the original printing. These editions were not instigated by a committee who decided that words had been translated incorrectly and needed to be updated. Instead, the later editions were necessary so that spelling could be corrected. The first two so-called revisions were actually two stages of one process, the purification of early printing errors. The last two so-called revisions were two stages in another process, the standardization of spelling. The two editions primarily dedicated to standardizing spelling were completed only seven years apart, in 1762 and 1769, respectively. The 1769 edition merely continued the process of spelling standardization begun in the 1762 edition. However, when the scholars are numbering revisions, two sounds better than one since it provides double the ammunition with which to justify infidelity to God's word. Very few textual corrections were necessary by this time, since the majority had been discovered and corrected in the first two editions. The thousands of alleged changes are in fact spelling changes that were made to match the established correct forms of word spelling. These spelling changes will be discussed later. Suffice it to say at this time that the tale of four major revisions is truly a fraud and a myth. But, you may say, changes are still changes regardless of how many there are. What are you going to do with the changes that are still there? Let us now examine the character of these changes. 3. The so-called thousands of changes. Suppose someone were to take you to a museum to see an original copy of the King James Bible. You approach the glass case where the Bible is on display and look down at the open Bible through the glass. Although you are not allowed to flip through its pages, you can readily tell that some things about this Bible are very different from the characteristics of the one you possess. You can hardly read its words, and those you can make out are spelled in strange ways. Like others before you, you leave with the impression that the King James Bible has undergone a multitude of changes since its original printing in 1611. Not so. Beware, lest you be deceived by a very clever ploy. The differences you see are not what they appear to be. Let's examine the evidence. For proper examination, the changes made to the 1611 King James Bible can be divided into three categories, printing changes, spelling changes, and textual changes. Printing changes. Printing changes will be considered first. The type style used in 1611 by the King James translators was the Gothic type style. The type style you are reading right now and are familiar with is Roman type. Gothic type, sometimes called Germanic type since it originated in Germany, uses letters formed to resemble the hand-drawn manuscript lettering of the Middle Ages. Printing technology was invented in Germany, and Gothic was the only type style used for some time. Roman type style was invented fairly early in the history of printing, but many years passed before it became the predominant style in most European countries. In fact, Gothic style remained in use in Germany until recent years. In England, the Roman type was already very popular and would soon supersede the Gothic style, but not until after 1611. The original printers of the King James Bible chose to use the Gothic style for its superior beauty and the embellishment it imparted to a manuscript. In 1612, the first King James Bible using Roman type was printed. Within a few years, all of the Bibles printed used the Roman type style. Please realize that a change in type style alters the text of the Bible no more than does a change in format or type size. However, the modern reader, unfamiliar with Gothic, generally finds it very difficult to read and understand. In addition to some general change in form, several specific letter changes existed under the Gothic style format. For instance, the Gothic S looks like the Romans when used as a capital letter or at the end of a word. However, when it is used as a lower case S at the beginning or in the middle of a word, the letter looks like our Roman F. Therefore, also becomes Alpho and Set becomes Fet. Another variation is found in the German V and U. The Gothic V appears as a Roman U, while the Gothic U takes the form of a Roman V. This explains why our W is called a W and not a double V. Sound confusing? It is until you get used to it. 
Frequently, early American architectural design used the Gothic style lettering when lettering many of our government buildings. Inscriptions in many of our government buildings, especially in Washington, D.C., reflect this Gothic style. That is why the Covington County Courthouse reads Quinton Comte Covered Hoffs. The format followed the Gothic style just as the early editions of the King James Bible did. In the 1611 edition, love is Lou, us is versus, and ever is ewer. But remember, such examples are not even spelling changes. They are simply type style changes. In another instance, the Gothic J looks like our I. So Jesus becomes Ephus. Notice the middle S looks like an F. Joy becomes IOE. Even the Gothic D is shaped quite differently from the Roman D with the stem leaning back over the circle in a shape resembling that of the Greek Delta, 6. These changes account for a large percentage of the alleged thousands of changes made in the various editions of the King James Bible, and they do no harm whatsoever to the text. Such changes are nothing more than a smokescreen set up by the attackers of our English Bible, in a fashion typical of the great accuser, Revelation 12 verse 10, He creation, Pill 16, Imag Lathop 19, and 17.04 held for, 44, Car 4, Lamp E, L, Chap, Luji Hiha, The, 3 in God Lamb, Let there be light, and there was light. For in God law the light, that it was good, and God buted the light from D.H.E. Barkanel. First Book of Moses, called Genesis. The begun on God created the Hoku and the earth. 2. Spelling changes. Photocopy of King James original 1611 page. Another kind of change made in early editions of the authorized version was changes of orthography or spelling. Most histories date the beginning of modern English around the year 1500. Therefore, by 1611, the grammatical structure and basic vocabulary of present-day English had long been established. However, English spelling was not yet stable and uniform at this time. In the 1600s, words were spelled according to whim. There was no such thing as correct spelling because no standards had been established. An author often spelled the same word several different ways in the same book and sometimes on the same page. And these were the educated people. Some readers may believe the 1600s to have been a spelling paradise. Not until the 1700s did the spelling begin to stabilize. Therefore, in the last half of the 18th century, spelling in the King James Bible of 1611 was standardized. What kind of spelling variations can you expect to find between your present edition and the printed edition of 1611? Although not every spelling difference can be categorized, several characteristic differences are very common. Additional E's were often found at the end of the words such as fear, dark, and beer. Also, double vowels were much more common than they are today. You would find me, B, and mud instead of me, B, and moved. Double consonants were also much more common. What would ran, yul, and stars be according to present-day spelling? See if you can figure them out. The present-day spellings would be ran, evil, and stars. These typographical and spelling changes account for almost all of the alleged thousands of changes in the King James Bible editions. None of these alter the text in any way. Therefore, these changes simply cannot be honestly compared with the thousands of unwarranted and unscriptural textual changes blatantly forced on the unsuspecting reader by the modern versions. Textual Changes Our study has covered almost all of the alleged changes thus far. We now come to the question of actual textual differences between our present edition of the King James Bible and the KJB of 1611. There are some differences between the two, but they are not the changes of a revision or mistranslation. They are instead the correction of early printing errors. By considering the facts, this truth becomes evident. We will examine and consider 1. The character of the changes 2. The frequency of the changes 3 the timing of the changes, the character of the changes. First, let us look at the character of the changes made since the time of the first printing of the authorized English Bible. The nature of textual changes made from the 1611 edition reveals them to be printing error corrections. They are not textual changes made to alter the reading of the scripture. In the first printing, words were sometimes inverted. Sometimes the plural was written as singular or vice versa. At times, a word was miswritten and mistakenly replaced with a similar one. 
In a few instances, a word or even a phrase was omitted. The omissions were obvious and did not have the doctrinal implications of those found in modern translations. In fact, there is no comparison between the corrections made in the King James text and the alterations introduced by present-day Bible publishers. F. H. A. Scrivener, in the appendix to his book, lists the variations between the 1611 edition and later printings. A sampling of these corrections follows. In order to be objective, the samples provided are the first textual corrections on consecutive left-hand pages of Scrivener's book. The 1611 reading is given first, then the present reading, and finally, the date the correction was first made. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 1611. This thing shalt have remained, axib, nor hellbath, nor aphic, requite good, the book of the covenant, chief rulers, and parbar, for this cause, for the king had appointed, seek good, the cormorant, returned, a fiery furnace, the crowned, present reading, this thing also, ye shall have remained, of Axib, nor of Helba, nor Aphic. Requite me good, the book of this covenant, chief ruler, at Parbar, and for this cause, for so the king had appointed, seek God, but the cormorant, turned, a burning fiery furnace, thy crowned, year, 1638, 1762, 1629, 1629, 1629, 1629, 1638, 1638, 1629, 1617, 1629, 1769, 1638, 1629, 15, 67, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Thy right doeth, the way's side, which was a Jew, the city, now and ever, which was of our fathers, thy right hand doeth, the wayside, which was a Jewess, the city of the Damascenes, both now and ever, which was our fathers, 1613, 1743, 1629, 1629, 1638, 1616, this sampling of 20 corrections reveals 5% of the textual changes made in the King James Bible in 375 years. Even if they were not simply corrections of previous printing errors, they pale in comparison to the modern version alterations to the text. In fact, they are printing error corrections, thus no legitimate comparison to today's changes exists. Examine the list carefully for yourself you will find only one variance which has potentially serious implications. The change referred to is found in Psalm 69 verse 32, in which the 1611 edition stated seek good. See number 10 above. In fact, in an examination of Scrivener's entire appendix, this is the only variation found by Dr. David Reagan that could be accused of having any significant doctrinal implications. Nevertheless, the facts reveal this discrepancy between the two editions to be nothing more than a printer's error. First, note the similarity between the spellings of the two words, good and God. It is not hard to imagine how a weary typesetter could have misread the proof and inserted the wrong word into the text. Second, the error was so obvious that it was caught and corrected in the year 1617, only six years after the original printing and long before the mythical so-called first revision. The nature of the myth that there have been several major revisions to the 1611 KJB should be clearing up. But there is more. Further research by Dr. Reagan reveals some interesting facts. In Middle English, up to the year 1500 or so, good was spelled in several ways. It could be spelled as good, good, goad, goud, good or god. The last spelling, god, was the most common spelling of good in Old English and corresponded to gut in German. The copyists may have thought they were only updating the spelling of good from the earlier spelling, God. No matter how the error crept in, it is obvious that neither this change, nor the others, support modern version producer claims that the KJB has been revised. The frequency of the changes. 
Not only does the character of these changes reveal them to be printing errors, so does their frequency. Modern scholarship referred to the thousands of revisions made to the 1611 as if they were similar in magnitude to revisions found in the recent Bible versions. They are not. The overwhelming majority of changes to the KJB 1611 are either type style or spelling alterations. The few remaining changes are clearly printing errors corrections. The preceding list of changes from early editions of the King James Bible demonstrates Scrivener's care to list all the variations. Yet, in spite of the tremendous effort expended to this end, only about 400 variations are named between the 1611 edition and the modern King James copies. One can well imagine how difficult it must have been to typeset the entire Bible, one letter at a time. It was so difficult that 100 variations were found between the first two Oxford editions, both printed within the first year, 1611, of publication. Since there are almost 1,200 chapters in the Bible, the average variation per chapter, after 375 years, is one correction for every three chapters. These are changes such as chief rulers to chief ruler and in parbar to at parbar. Still, an additional piece of the evidence conclusively proves that these variations were simply printing error corrections the early date at which they were made. The timing of the changes. The character and frequency of the textual changes plainly separates them from alterations in the modern versions. However, the time at which the changes were made settles the issue absolutely for those truly seeking the truth. The great majority of the 400 corrections were made within a few years of the original printing. Take, for example, our earlier sampling. Of the 20 corrections listed, one was made in 1613, one in 1616, one in 1617, eight in 1629, five in 1638, one in 1743, two in 1762, and one in 1769. 16 out of 20 corrections in the aforementioned sample, or 80%, were made within 27 years of the 1611 printing. In another study, made by examining every other page of Scrivener's appendix in detail, 72% of the textual corrections were made by 1638. This definitely does not indicate a long drawn-out series of revisions the scholars would have you believe. Thus, there is no revision issue. An imperfect method was used to print the Bibles, and the imperfections were simply found and corrected. God purposefully did not drop a supercomputer from heaven in 1611 so that those looking for reasons to distrust God's promise of supernatural preservation would have many. The character of the textual changes is that of obvious errors. The frequency of the textual changes is sparse, occurring on average only once in every three chapters of the Bible. The chronology of the textual changes is early, with about three-fourths of them occurring within 27 years of the first printing. All of these details establish the fact that there were no true revisions in the sense of updating the language or correcting any translation errors. There were only additions correcting early typographical errors. The source of authority for the exact wording of the 1611 authorized version is not in the existing copies of the first printing. Instead, the source of authority for the exact wording of our English Bible is in the preserving power of Almighty God. Just as God did not leave us the original autographs to fight and squabble over, neither did he see fit to leave us the proof copy of the translation. Our authority is in the hand of God, not the imperfections of man or our technological inadequacies. Praise the Lord for that. 4. Changes in the Book of Ecclesiastes an in-depth study of the changes made in the book of Ecclesiastes should help to illustrate the principles previously stated. By comparing a 1611 reprint of the original edition published by Thomas Nelson and Sons with a recent printing of the King James Bible, Dr. Dave Reese was able to locate four variations in the book of Ecclesiastes. The reference is given first, followed by the text of the Thomas Nelson 1611 reprint. The text is then followed by the reading of the present editions of the 1611 KJB. Finally, the date of the change is included. Verse 1 colon 5, 2 16, 8 17, 11 17, the place shall be Thomas Nelson out, yet further. This is it. His place shall all be present edition out, yet he shall not find it, yet farther. Thing it is, year, 1638, 1629, 1629, 
Several points should be noted concerning these changes. The last variation, thing is it to thing it is, is not mentioned by Scrivener, who was very accurate and thorough in his analysis. Therefore, this change may be a misprint in the Thomas Nelson reprint. That would be interesting. The corrected omission in Chapter 8 is one of the longest corrections of the original printing, but notice that the correction was made in 1629. The frequency of printing errors is, on average, for errors for every 12 chapters. The most outstanding fact is that the entire book of Ecclesiastes read exactly like our present editions by the year 1638, since all printing errors in the book had been located and corrected by this time. That was over 375 plus years ago. By that time, the Bible was being printed in Roman type. Therefore, all that's right, all that has changed in 375 plus years in the book of Ecclesiastes is that the spelling has been standardized. As stated before, the main purpose of the 1629 and 1638 Cambridge editions was the correction of earlier printing errors. The main purpose of the 1762 and 1769 editions was spelling standardization. So much for the attempts to discredit the King James Bible in order to justify scriptural infidelity and pass off the newest translation. V. The supposed justification for other revisions. It should now be clear that the King James Bible of 1611 has not been revised, but has been corrected due to the errors of an imperfect printing process. Why does this fact matter? Although there are several reasons why this issue is important, the most pressing one is that unscrupulous, as well as, well-meaning individuals are using this myth of past revisions to justify their contemporary tampering with the biblical text. For instance, the editors of the New King James Version have probably been the worst in recent years to use this propaganda ploy. In the New King James preface they state, for nearly 400 years, and throughout several revisions of its English form, the King James Bible has been deeply revered among the English-speaking peoples of the world. In the midst of their flowery rhetoric, they strongly imply that their edition is only a continuation of the revisions that have been going on for the past 400 plus years. This implication, stated directly by others also, could not be more false. To prove this point, we return to the book of Ecclesiastes. An examination of the first chapter in the book of Ecclesiastes in the New King James Version reveals approximately 50 changes from our present edition of the King James Bible. In order to be fair, spelling changes, cometh to comes, labor to labor, etc. were not included in this count. That means there are probably about 600 alterations in the book of Ecclesiastes and approximately 60,000 changes in the entire Bible between the KJB and the NKJV. This estimated count includes every recognizable change of the sort which were identified in analyzing the 1611 King James Bible. These criteria are only fair. Still, the number of changes is especially baffling for a version which claims to be updating the King James Bible in the same vein as the earlier revisions. According to the fundamentalist scholar, the new King James is only the fifth in a series of revisions. How, then, did four revisions in 375 years produce a mere 400 changes, while the fifth revision brought about approximately 60,000 additional changes? If this is the case, the fifth revision made 150 times more changes than the total number of changes made in the first four combined. That is simply preposterous. Not only is the frequency of the changes in the New King James Version unbelievable, but the character of the alterations is serious too. Although some of the alterations seem harmless at first glance, many are much more serious. The editors of the New King James Version were sly enough not to align themselves with the most serious blunders of the other modern versions. Yet, they were not afraid to change the reading in those places unfamiliar to the average King James user. In these areas, the New King James Version is dangerous. Below are some of the more harmful alterations made in the Book of Ecclesiastes in the NKJV. The reference is given first followed by the reading from the King James Bible, and then the reading from the New King James Version. Ref 113, 114, 116, King James, sore travail, vexation of spirit. My heart had great experience of wisdom. New King James, grievous task, grasping for the wind. My heart has understood great wisdom. 2 colon 3, 2 21, 3 10, 
to give myself unto equity, the travail which God hath given, the world, that God might manifest them. They themselves are beasts. Portion, right work, keep thy foot, the angel, thy voice, he that is higher than the highest. God answereth him, untimely birth, inventions, boldness, the place of the holy, to gratify my flesh with guiding, skill, the God-given task, eternity, God tests them, they themselves are like beasts, heritage, skillful work, walk prudently, the messenger of God, your excuse, high official, God keeps him busy, stillborn child, schemes, sternness, the place of holiness, 10 colon 1, 10 10, 10 10, 12 colon 9, 12 11, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor, if the iron be blunt, wisdom is profitable to direct, gave good heed, the masters of assemblies, dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment, if the axe is dull, wisdom brings success, pondered, scholars, this represents only a sampling of the changes in the book, but notice what has been done, equity, which is a trait of godliness, becomes skill, 221, the world becomes eternity, 311, Man without God is no longer a beast, but just like a beast, 318. The clear reference to deity in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 8, he that is higher than the highest, is effectively removed and changed to higher official. But since success is what wisdom is supposed to bring us, 1010, this must be progress. At least God is keeping the scholars busy, 520. Probably the most revealing of the aforementioned changes is the last one listed, in which the masters of assemblies become scholars. According to the New King James Version, the words of scholars are like well-driven nails, given by one shepherd. The masters of assemblies are replaced by the scholars who become the source of the shepherd's words. That is what these scholars would like us to think, though not true. In conclusion, the New King James Version is not a revision in the vein of former editions of the King James Bible. It is instead an entirely new translation, qualifying for its own copyright. As stated in the introduction, the purpose of this chapter is not to convince those who use the other versions. The purpose of this chapter is to expose a fallacious argument that has been circulating in what used to be Bible-believing circles. The proposition that the New King James Version, and others like it, is nothing more than a continuation of revisions made to the King James Bible since 1611 is simply an overblown myth. The most glaring error in this theory is that there have been no such revisions. The King James Bible of 1611 has not undergone four or any major revisions. Therefore, the New King James Version is not a continuation of what has gone on before. The NKJV should, in fact, be called the Thomas Nelson version. Thomas Nelson holds the copyright. The King James Bible we have today has not been revised, but purified. There is still no reason to doubt that the Bible we hold in our hands is the very word of God preserved for us in the English language. The authority for its veracity lies not in the first printing of 1611, nor in the character of King James I, nor in the scholarship of the 1611 translators, nor in the literary accomplishments of Elizabethan England, nor even in the Greek received text. Our authority for the infallible words of the English Bible lies in the power and promise of God to preserve His Word. God has the power. We have His Word on it.